Hello, everyone. Welcome to the weekly TSC call. As I think you all know, this is a public call. Everybody is welcome to join you. However, however, you need to live and be aware and live by the antitrust policy, the notice of which is currently displayed, and the, the code of conduct, which governs all our activities within Hyperledger. So, with that taken care of, we can move on to the announcements. Right. Yep. I saw you inserted that first bullet, so I'll let you take it. Okay. Um, it is what it says on the 10. Um, due to the HGF being uh, the week after the monthly DevRel call has been pulled in a week. So it is uh, next week on the 2nd of June. And uh, that's a chance for developers and marketing to. Uh, to get together and figure out how to work better together. Um, Helen, if you're on the call and you want to say anything else. Yeah, I believe I added that as well <laughs> on the third bullet there. Um, but yeah, we're going to be talking about a few things uh, next week, um, just reviewing uh, some of the work that's been doing uh, happening on the white paper and greenhouse uh, update task force. We're going to walk through um, Kind of what's going on with with HGF uh, the global form in terms of the technical tracks just to make sure that we're spotlighting ones um, on social media and, and helping promote um, the sessions that you all are in. <laughs> we want to make sure that if there's anything we should call out or especially highlight, um, we'd love to have your input on that conversation. Um, and then also the DevRel newsletter, which is here on next bullet point. Um, just if there's any other content suggestions or you know ways with that we could kind of hunt out some more information from the community. Um, we just have uh, appreciate everybody's uh, thoughts and input on those those topics and would love to see you there. All right, thank you, Ellen and Rai. I mean, you know, people always come to the TSC saying, please, can you help us get more people interested in our project? I mean, it's one way to get, you know, to socialize your project and possibly get more people to join your effort is to advertise it and take advantage of this kind of like, you know, marketing um, possibilities we have. So not every open source project has that uh, ability. So we have it. It's a shame we're not taking more advantage of it. So please do consider doing so. All right, otherwise we just have two reminders, the weekly, uh, uh, developer newsletter. Again, this is yet another opportunity to advertise what's going on in your project. And then the um, the uh, Hyperledger Global Forum registration. Please make sure you are registered and then uh, let the word out. I guess I will add one more announcement. Uh, for those who are maintainers, you must have seen I sent an email to the maintainers list. I'll have the opportunity to give a TSC update um, at the beginning of the conference. And I figured it would be nice to give a little bit of an update on the different projects. Obviously, I can't get into the details, but if you send me a bullet or two that you want to kind of highlight about your project, maybe it's like a major release you had over the last 12 months, or that's coming up, something you want to draw attention to, um, please send me this and uh, I will try to insert this into my deck. And I mean, obviously, you know, I can't get into any details, but my idea was to kind of, you know, maybe get people to pay attention and then maybe get their, you know, um, interest into finding out more. We have plenty of sessions about the different projects with demos and whatnot. And it's a way to advertise a little bit what's going on. So if I can be of help, I have 20 minutes, I have a bunch of things I'd like to cover. So I don't know how much I'll be able to say, but if you send me, like I said, a bullet or two, I will try to insert this. So that's yet another opportunity to advertise what's going on in your project. You've been told. <laughs> Any other announcements anyone wants to make? All right, hearing none, let's move on. So the Hyperledger Borrow quarterly report is overdue. I actually sent an email to Silas a couple of days ago. I haven't 
response I haven't received any response yet which is somewhat unusual because usually he responds pretty quickly saying sorry I can't do this now now for now I haven't even received that but uh, let's give him the benefit of the doubt hopefully he will respond to my email soon and I'll you know either he will say when he might be able to do it if not now or he will say yes I'll get to it that's usually how it works so otherwise we had two uh, reports one for grid one for transact I have to give Andrea credit for always being on point and you know she's always submitting and posting those reports and announcing them to the TSC list which is kind of nice so that everybody is aware uh, it seems like I was just looking at that before the call it seems like most of the TSC members the majority have reviewed those reports they didn't you know raise any alarms or, or you know request for the TSC to do anything so unless there is anybody who wants to get into uh, one of those reports now I think uh, everything is good but this is your chance if you want to say anything all right if not let's move on so we have a pretty packed agenda we'll see you know i'll do like i did last week well we obviously have the firefly proposal and depending on how long we spend on this we'll see how far we go through the rest but you know i think there's nothing really super time sensitive so i'm not going to kill myself over trying to cover everything today we'll see how far we can go all right so the firefly sorry the firefly proposal proposal has been out for now a couple of weeks there was quite a bit of discussion uh, we spent the whole call last week pretty much on that and there was some follow-up I know that the team has also um, uh, been talking to various uh, people and uh, trying to answer their questions they have expanded significantly the proposal which more information so I'll give who is there Steve on, or yeah, Steve, you want to give an update on what happened? I mean, you did send an email. Thank you for this, highlighting yeah. a little bit what happened. And maybe you just do some kind of repeat of what's in your email, or if there's any yeah. further changes you want to highlight. I'll, I'll let I'll let uh, Peter take it away. All right, very good, Peter. Thanks, Steve. So so we've had some great conversations um, over the last last week. Um, a, um, a lot is focused on trying to, to make sure everyone understands what the project is and, and what it isn't. I mean, I would like to offer, um, really trying hard to be brief, uh, to do a, a quick version of that. Maybe some of the, the key um, the key highlights that, that people got value out of from these from these conversations during the week to do a quick version um, of that on this call. Um, the, the proposal updates um, uh, include some details on use cases, some illustrative use cases, but we've actually gone through three levels, thinking about the big problem in blockchain which Firefly is trying to solve around the consumability of the technology for enterprise use cases. Um, and then to drill down through an example of one of hundreds of possible um, uh, business use cases. So a, a more business example, rather than just a, a, a technical example. Um, and to show the kind of interactions that with or without Firefly are going to exist in that kind of, of use case. Um, so hopefully that um, has helped to address um, some of the questions around the, um, the kind of use cases where this mixture of on-chain logic and off-chain coordination um, with real applications that are meaty and large and exist off of the chain, um, integrations to core systems, where, where those problems intersect that Firefly is trying to, trying to help with. 
Um, I did just want to mention before maybe saying if we want to take me up on the offer of just going through a little bit of that that detail um, on on sort of how the how the ping pong works because that really helped some people. I did want to mention there was an open question last week about licensing and the interaction between the Apache two code of ETH Connect, one of the plugins for Firefly that's been contributed. Um, and um, the LGPL code that's inside of the Go Ethereum project in Go. Um, actually do have an update on this. We've done the work since last week. Um, it's not merged into master, but it's fully proved out to split the binding code that's needed to, um, to allow the core EthConnect Apache 2 code to talk to the LGPL code, to split that into a separate repo and have that as a separate build going into a shared a shared library, a .so file on, um, on, on Linux, for example, um, and to be loaded um, uh, via dynamic linking rather than static linking. Um, so hopefully that addresses the, the concern um, that of the incompatibility between LGPL and static linking um, that, was, that was raised. Um, and um, should allow the EthConnect code base to go in with the Firefly core code base um, on day one, if that's um, if that's appropriate. So, so that was a few a few items there, and an offer to drill down into a little bit more more detail. All right, thank you, Peter. So, is are there any other questions from anyone? Tracy. So my question is around that latter point of the licensing. Um, does that limit the platforms on which this could work? Um, it, it, it means that um, if there were a company that wanted to extend the Firefly community in a proprietary non-open source way, and that that company wanted to um, use the ETH Connect piece, and that company didn't want to provide a non-LGPL plugin because there's a plug point now. They could put a, provide a non-LGPL one using borrow code, etc. Um, and and um, and they wanted to use Windows rather than Docker. That company trying to extend the ecosystem might hit a hit hit, hit a challenge around specifically not being able to build on Windows because the Go, the Go technology um, does not uh, support dynamic linking yet on, on Windows. They could build it on their laptops, they could build it anywhere that they have access to the source and that would all be fine. Um, they just couldn't create a paid private closed source distribution without doing the work that we talked about last week of implementing these 20 or so hug points that, 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 um, that would be needed on ETH Connect to replace the LGPL code. Does that answer your question, Tracy? Uh, I think so. <laughs> um, I guess that I, I'll follow up with a slightly different question then, um, which is, what limitations would any enterprise using this have? Uh, maybe I'll just leave it at that question. So obviously with Apache 2 and the, the patent licensing and everything else that's uh, given with Apache 2, enterprises can, can use uh, things as they desire, right? Um, so what, what limitations would uh, somebody have other than obviously the Windows piece? Believe none. Um, that, that their solution would be using all kinds of dynamically linked LGPL libraries. The, if they were using Linux or Docker, they'd probably be using hundreds of them. So this would just be another LGPL library in the in the mix that's been been dynamically linked to their code. Yeah, it sounds like you've managed to work around the main issue. Gary is next. Hey, thank you, Arno. Um, sort of, you know, uh, you know, in, in tune with Tracy's question, but I don't really have a question about it. But uh, again, I think sometimes we, I always like to bring this up, we mistake the points here, right? So 
even if the as the code stands today, even if you had that code in that repository, and enterprise, Peter specifically was very clear in the words, right? A commercial offering where you actually provide the distribution to somebody else, right? That's fundamentally the LGPL license and the GPL license, right? Like, you know, and, and again, technically the license just says that you have to provide the source to any of your changes if you do it. And, and of course the stuff that's in there. So to me, you know, I think this was a good solution, right? It doesn't limit any enterprise's ability to use it even on windows. It means that they can't make, it means that if I took it and then want to make a commercial distribution about of it, then yes, I might have an issue, right? And, but fundamentally all that really says is you have to have specify that license and any changes you, you know, but our code was all, the rest of the code's already open source. So I think this is kind of a, a no-op in a way. I think the solution's clever. Um, you know, I would have also said, if we don't, if we don't uh, include the code in the repository, right, then again, you can also, you know, link to other stuff, right? This is how we do it with, no, with a lot of the Node.js stuff, right? We don't actually, you know, the equivalent of Golang, we don't vendor code. We don't include Node modules within the uh within our node repositories right with go we used to vendor them right because you need to, because go didn't have a good package distribution right with go mod um and uh and the ability to sort of seal those right you can actually you know get reproducible builds right so anyway i'll just leave it at that but i don't i think this is a good solution to it I, but i don't think that there's an actual really actually an issue all right thank you gary dano is next so my concern is that you still have to do extra steps if you want to release it under Windows, which is unlike any of the other Apache projects we have if you want to release it under Windows. So while it legally meets the standard, um, I think it kind of misses the spirit of the point of the Apache 2 outbound code, um, but it, it meets the legal standard. Um, was much effort looked into it to try to get Burrow to replace what Go was doing, Go Ethereum? So, so the, 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 what's happened over the last week is carving out the, um, the interface. We haven't, this is obviously a project used very actively. The, um, so, um, so changing the implementation of the RP encoding would be a longer piece of work. Um, I, I, it's a, a great piece of work, it's available. Um, Dan or anyone else would be, you know, should be a straightforward piece of work to do if somebody knows that code and, and wants to contribute it. We don't see uh, uh, an imperative to do it as we understand it. I think to Gary's point, there's, there's not a problem here that needs solving immediately in the coming days is our understanding, given what we've done. Um, and um, there's a straightforward path to 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 someone who was in that that edge case of of not using not using um, Docker and wanting to to swap in that code. There's a straightforward path for them to swap that code in. Um, we 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 don't. I mean, if, if there's a real explicit requirement for Collido as a member of this community to be the ones who creates a new implementation of the OLP encoding um, binaries for this particular project, it'd be good to hear that um, from, from this community. But, but right now we don't, we don't see a reason why that's a, a, a critical action to take right now. And we think the code is in a great place. Don't think it's in a, a strange place for an Apache 2 project. I think it's in it's in a really good place um, and should be um, uh, ready for community involvement and and commercial exploitation. Tracy is back on. No, Dan, no, is you still on? Okay, Tracy. Okay, so uh, the last piece that you said caught me. Um, it sounded like we you have a solution, but it's yet not in the source base. I, I guess the expectation would be that it would be there prior to bring it into Hyperledger. Um, no, no, sorry, 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 Tracy. Um, the, the, the solution that was discussed last week of making it dynamically linked code rather than statically linked code so that anyone reading the LGPL license would go, oh yeah, that's dynamically linked, no problem. Like there's no, like it's conformant in either way is our understanding, but you wouldn't need to talk to a lawyer about it. It would just be, oh, obviously it's dynamically linked. No, it's, it, that's done. That's completely done. 
and bikes. Yeah, that's that's metal. that's what I was talking about, Peter. It sounded like you said that it wasn't in master. It's a solution that is possible. Um, all of those sounded like words that to Sorry. me were, were were not such that you were quite ready to have that uh, available for wider use. Sorry, Tracy. No, that, that, that was in response to Dan. I was suggesting there's another piece of work, an orthogonal piece of work that could be done, which is to take OLP encoding code that's part of the Boro project that exists in Go under a different license, was done clean room without any without any reference to the code that was created by the Go Ethereum community. Um, and you could implement a second dynamic linking library that, that used that code. And we, and we haven't done that work. Um, the dynamic linking library does still use the Go Ethereum code. I wasn't thinking yeah. of making a second dynamic linking library. I was thinking of skipping the dynamic linking library part and just using Vero. That was my initial proposal. Yeah, so I think I think that I think there's two pieces, right? One is pulling the code out in order to make it LGBL dynamically linked library. Uh, and that's the one that I'm questioning. The other solution, which is using Burrow to directly replace any of the code that's currently uh, calling the LGPL piece, uh, Go Ethereum. That's the second piece. So I'm mostly concerned right now with the first piece and making sure that that is uh, available in the source space uh, as we speak today in the master. Uh, it's available in the source space. Um, at, at the beginning of this call, it hasn't been merged into master because there's, um, there's there's just the practicalities of um, of of uh, a, a day's testing needed for that switch to happen um, um, and um, uh, Jim who led, led that work um, uh, uh, has, has completed it he, he has some commitments today so it may not be today but we can make it today if it needs to be today but the code's proved it's ready it's there um, it, it's simply just because this is a, a, a highly it's, 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 it's two years further ahead in the journey. Um, uh, it's used in production projects. We just need to make sure, as, as with every um, open source community, that that last phase of it going into master happens when it's it's gone through all of the checks and balances. So it's as, it's as simple as that. It's not it's not that the code's not ready. It's just um, uh, it's just not not yet flicked from 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 a branch into master. Yeah, I would I would say that's a prerequisite to bringing it into the Hyperledger um, yeah. repositories. That's I, I, all think, I wanted to bring up. I think, Tracy, we can definitely make that a uh, requirement, uh, you know, if we want to approve this with that uh, caveat. And I think that's reasonable. But it sounds like this is just a matter of time. They have the, they have the intention to do so anyway. Let's go to the queue, Angelo. Uh, I, uh, thanks, Arno. Uh, not sure. I would like to move to another subject, not the, the license, uh, uh, the licensing thing, if it's okay, possible. So let's see if Gary still wants to talk about yep. this. Well, I don't really want to talk about it. I just wanted to say, I mean, again, it's, you know, people can put whatever dependencies they want, but I guess we should answer the question: Is the does is the code as is? Does it violate being uh, uh, contributed with an Apache license? And, and I don't think that, I, don't, I, I think as long as the LGBTL code's not actually in there, then it doesn't. This is how this, we do this question, yeah. This is what we this, do with all of Node.js. This is every node, every node thing that we do, right? We do not include the node modules in there. Uh, and that does not affect the source code. So <laughs> I guess that's my point and I'll leave it with, by the way, Kubernetes does not allow you to build uh, the control plane for Windows today. So like not having Windows support is not a problem. Uh, sorry, Brian, you answer, you, you, you're, you're about to answer my question, I think, so I'll I, I was you. barging in and very rudely, <laughs> I apologize for that. No worries. Um, I, now this, is, this question of dependencies is something that 
the Apache Software Foundation has pages and pages on, um, and there are categories of licenses they allow to be depended and, and that sort of thing. Um, and and it's and a critical question is, is it in the repo? A second critical question is, is it distributed from Apache org infrastructure, or in our case, from the resources under our control, right? Um, and, and for example, LGPL code cannot be contributed into an Apache project, even in a vendor branch or that sort of thing. Um, it can be depended upon at, at build time, uh, and I believe it can't be distributed from Apache org servers. So I think um, any proposal that has a dependency on LGPL, especially upon an abstractly defined interface for which there could be a re-implementation under something else, completely fine. Um, I, it's something I just wanna highlight for, for folks uh, you know, who are coming into the project, but um, uh, as long as it's not checked in on a vendor branch, then I think we're all good. And then a core question becomes, do we distribute Docker images or, or other kind of system images with that in? And I think we we would need to come up with a policy for that because I think we've avoided having to answer that question previously. All right, thank you, Brian, for that clarification. Hopefully that uh, helps people who are concerned about this. And I, so, I'm pretty sure that means I think this is a fine proposal. Yeah. <laughs> That's well, that's what I'm getting from what you're saying. So Gary says that too. So I'll take your word for it. And there is work anyway to try to reduce the friction at that level too. So I think we're in good shape. Angelo. Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, if I can uh, switch a little bit, I, I still yes. personally have um, some some issue with the with the, uh, it's my just my point of view i uh, just want to say stress this um so in, in the document it's written something like data privacy by default then the example that is given it's not really data privacy by default uh, because uh, the tokens are leaking are leaking information about the, who is the owner of the token the content of the token uh, the tokens itself um so can we can is it, it would be possible to just scale down a little bit the uh, the the sentences the, the the magnitude of the the sentences also in the abstract it's written it solves all of the layers of complexity i mean are, is it does it really don't, don't you think that is a bit too uh, too stretched the, as a as Brian this in the sense i'm i'm saying this because if you really do that uh, i mean it means that you have such a, you have a global solution based on strong cryptography, like a, a paper, like, I don't know if you know the paper ZXE, that gives a, a complete system that is privacy preserving based on, on, on zero knowledge. And to me, this, this the Firefly doesn't seem to go in, um, in that direction. So, which message are we sending if we this publish if this uh, this project gets published? And I, I I see the goal of the and I I find very interesting the goal of the project. But are we re, are you really making it? Are you really delivering this? You said that uh, the project has been used in production already. Uh, do we deliver zero knowledge already in production? Uh, can we see the code? I mean, maybe given okay. that you are open source in this, can we see it? I, I think this is a good point, Angelo. Maybe you guys need to tone down a little bit the expectation. Some of these claims may be a bit far-fetched, but you know, uh, maybe with less of a marketing hat on, <laughs> you can say that you aim at solving, you know, the layers of complexity and be a little bit more humble. Sure. Um, so I, just, I guess it, it would be very expensive to do small word wrangling on, on a large call like this. So I'm suggesting we probably take that one off offline and, and really happy to, to, to make sure the words are accurate and um, really help people understand what they what they do get, that it's the layers of complexity yeah, yeah, yeah. that aren't solved by all of the components underneath that are being solved. Um, uh, not not the layers of complexity inside of those components. So, um, uh, so just, just a suggestion for that, uh, Angelo, we, we've had dozens of comments 
uh, in the document through the last few weeks. If, if you wouldn't mind just uh, highlighting some of the areas where you have questions or where you think the wording could be clarified, we're, we're happy to, to use to continue to use that mechanism to, to improve the document. I, I would uh, ask you to consider, uh, you know, the link at the top of this document is a 404 now. Um, I would ask you to consider actually filing this as a HIP in GitHub. And then all of these comments and pointers and stuff will be preserved in the TSC repo. Um, we were trying to get away from doing Google Docs before. So I, I would just, as a disinterested observer. That's a good point. And, and, and for, for that matter, if you go to, for instance, so to the wiki page, and you know it points to a Google Doc that was the proposal for SoTooth, which no longer exists. And you get a 404 saying, sorry, don't know that document. So we seem to have lost a piece of history there, which is always the danger when we rely on external third party systems, even if it's from Google. So I second the uh, rise point on that one. Okay, any other questions? Angelo, you agree with that? I mean, I think it's reasonable. You should just point out if there are things that need to be toned down, maybe make suggestions on rewording some of the sentences. I think it's a quick pass that it can address the issue you're, you're pointing out, which I think is fair. Grace. Hey there. Um... My question is a little bit of a pivot, but I'd love to hear more about the community management um, processes that you all are planning to do for Hyper with the Firefly. I think it's a little challenging when it doesn't have an open source history to turn to and say, oh, all of these you know, activities have already been done, so we can see you're going to continue to do it. So I'd love to hear more details around, you know, you're going to have contributor calls, how you're going to integrate with the Hyperledger community. Just want to make sure that uh, y'all have thought of that thoroughly. Um, very, very much top of mind. I, I guess we are saying that the Hyperledger um, community is going to influence us here, as well as um, uh, as, as well as being a place to um, to bring those contributors together, being a place that has um, standards that we can follow, um, uh, and that we can we can use those as the as the as the as the template um or, or are you saying each that that it's in in hyperledger the intention is that that they you know that they, they shouldn't be kind of that uni unified approach it's much more each individual project should should have its own sort of from scratch processes uh, it looks like Brian's having his hands up, but typically there's kind of uh, individual uh, project organization and uh, hyperledger cost project organization. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, we are, as Hyperledger staff, definitely signed up to help facilitate the development of this community. Uh, we've talked a bunch with the Kaleido team about the fact that, you know, when building this now as an open source project, it means there is engagement with the community that they'll need to do and and ways to, you know, uh, search for bringing people up the, the, the learning curve from being, you know, first timers to uh, all the way to becoming fellow core maintainers on the project. Um, I think, you know, there's still a lot of uh, folks who are perhaps new to Hyperledger, even new to open source, um, although certainly consuming lots of open source and so not not unfamiliar with it. Um, and we're we're very eager to work with a team on on uh, just as you know we did with consensus or on Bezu, just as we've done with other projects here to to help set the conditions that when people show up, you know, they're they're met with um, a welcoming community. Um, it is you know something we'll definitely want the TSCs help with too, and and um, you know and, and we'll get out there with get out word about the project uh, to try to recruit more contributors. Um, and I think just to turn it back to Kaleido, like, um, uh, you know, the expectation is, you know, as this code is, is continues to be built, you know, and continues to be innovated, that um, what previously had happened as kind of internal development processes, you know, against a, a internal whiteboard, internal uh, um, issue tracker, whatever, planning tools, somewhat turns inside out, right, and becomes kind of exposed. So it's more than just the code, it's also the process yeah. of that further development. And everything I've heard from Kaleido, by the way, uh, for everyone else here has been that they recognize that and they un 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 want that and seek that because that's gonna help make this a, a better product. So I, I would love to- We've been really trying to walk the walk rather than talk the talk there. So yeah. since 
you know, since this, this process has begun, we've taken every architecture document, created issues in Git, pointed to them. We put it in Git knowing it was the wrong place because we assume that once we go past this phase, there'll be the right place inside of Hyperledger, the right community whiteboarding tool or what, um, et cetera, for, for those sort of collaborative discussions on, on documents that they'll exist. But we, we try to sort of turn stuff inside out, make sure that um, that from that point on, all of the code changes are, are happening and the, the comments, et cetera, where we can are, are happening in the community. And we know that there's more to do um, in, in, in that space and we're excited to do it. That's the, the reason for going through this process is an excitement to, to really bring wider um, community um, evolution, like all the way from architecture through to implementation um, of, 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 of this. Um, uh, so, so hopefully, if you if you looked at the repo, you'd see a real sort of demonstration through action of, of change. Um, um, but you're, you're right that it's still right now that those contributors are um, are, are primarily there with a with a Clido, you know, Clido name badge, um, uh, and and that's really something we're we're looking forward to changing. All right, let me interject here. I mean, a couple of things I wanted to say on that very point. Uh, the first is. Well, you know, welcome to the club. This is, you know, what every company that's switching from proprietary uh, development model to open source has to go through. It is not always easy. And, you know, it does require uh, changing your mindset and the way you work so that you don't have internal meetings where you exclude de facto everybody else. And it, it does require quite a bit of an effort. And I speak, you know, from experience. But uh, the other part is, you know, we have an incubation stage uh, for that purpose as well. It's, you know, to get out of incubation, to graduate, your project will have to demonstrate that, you know, it does behave the way we expect as a real open source project with all the, you know, bells and whistles that come with this, including having CIs and, and whatnot. So I think for now, we, uh, we can leave that to later. Uh, I don't think it's a requirement uh, to, to uh, you know, I, we, I think it's fair to assume that the Kaleido team does in, have, you know, good uh, intentions. And the reason they come to Hyperledger is because they want to be an open source project. So I think uh, that shouldn't be held against them. Uh, I, I wanted to, if I may, interject a very practical question, which should be much simpler for you guys to answer. Uh, and I'm sorry, I didn't have time to dig further into the, the, the code to figure it out myself. But one thing I was wondering is in terms of, from an operational point of view, so I understand you have these Firefly nodes and then underneath you rely on some blockchain network to be there, but who manages the blockchain network? I mean, in your demo for development purposes, I understand the Firefly CLI will create a small network for you to play with. But in production, my impression is that you would have, you know, um, you would use whatever tools is appropriate to manage your blockchain network, depending on which, what blockchain framework you actually use. And then you would instruct your nodes at the Firefly layer to basically connect to the nodes in the blockchain network. Or is it that, no, Firefly is going to manage the whole blockchain network for you? Great question. It's the former on a, um, yeah. the, the blockchain network, but also the other networks like the private messaging network. If you're not using the built in just peer to peer um, HTTP, you know, the, the, the open source plugin that just comes with Firefly. If you, you've got your ActiveMQ or Artemis private messaging network, right? That, that plugs in it, your, your, um, your broadcast data storage, um, something like IPFS or Swarm. That, that just plugs in and, and the management of those that's com that's you know by by architecture that's decoupled from um from having firefly as um a sort of unifying component exposing the api um and the you know that that private data interface to your applications okay that makes sense thank you uh, Brian, you still have your hand up. Is that on purpose or just forgot? Ah, uh, shoot. Sorry about that. Okay. 
All right, any other questions? Tracy. Yeah, one of the one of the questions that I think we have asked of other projects coming in is uh, commitment outside of one organization, right? And I, I don't know if we tend to bring that up because that's part of the exit from incubation sort of uh, piece or, or not, but I, I wanted to see like, you know, obviously not open source yet. Uh, how do we get kind of the momentum behind this and bring in other sort of organizations such that we're not just looking at Kaleido as a single organization supporting this. So I, it's interesting you bring that up because I have to say, I, uh, my recollection was wrong when it comes to, you know, uh, in, in a separate email, uh, Arun actually asked me, hey, what does sponsor you know, what qualifies a sponsor for a project proposal? We actually had quite a bit of discussion of sponsors for creating labs, but we never really got too much to talk about sponsors for proposals. And in my mind, I was like, but in the project case, these are companies. And then I went to look and I realized this was wrong. All the previous proposals were actually sponsored, so to speak, you know, by individuals. In the very first case, Fabric, uh, the affiliation is not even mentioned. <laughs> it's just two people, you know, as a, and, and so I don't know. I mean, here they have added quite a few people to their proposal, but so I just wanted to give the background there. You know, it, it is not well defined. I, I have to highlight that. And, uh, and yeah, I don't, I don't think it's it has the been sponsor, so. I'm sorry. I don't think it. I don't think it's the sponsors, though. I think it's the section that we have in there about resources dedicated. Uh, and I think right now what we have is six people from Kaleido and one person focused only on ETH Connect. Uh, potentially, I think it's a, from another company. And so that's. I think that's the the piece where where I was thinking about uh, the support from multiple companies. Yep. Okay, I get that. And this is Dave, kind of following up on that. More generally, I wanted to ask maybe some of the other TSC members that have been around longer than I have that have approved other projects. Are there other criteria that's been looked at in terms of making something a lab versus a project? What types of things should we be looking at um, for crossing that threshold? I think it's fair to say we don't have anything really written down with like very clear objective criteria. Uh, we, we have raised the question as to whether going through a lab was a mandatory step. And we clearly said, no, there is a record of that in the decision log, I'm sure somewhere. I would have to dig for it, but you can trust me. I know we specifically asked that question and answered, no, it's not a mandatory step. We never got to the point of discussing, well, where, does, where do you draw the line? Historically, we have had a few projects proposal or project proposals come to the TSC where we said, you know what, we just don't see, you know, enough support for this at this point. And we suggest you go to a lab and that will give you an opportunity to increase, you know, visibility of your, your, your project and gain momentum behind it. And then maybe you can transition to a project. But, um, you know, I, in all fairness, I don't think this was very objective based on like very objective criteria we were applying. So there is a room for uh, subjectivity here, I'm afraid. Right, and, and what would, I guess, set this project apart from those other projects that we were said they should start as labs? You know, uh, one of the things that gave us, uh, re I'm sorry, I should have raised my hand. Uh, I'm okay, jumping out of heart. Uh, let me, I'm sorry about that. Go ahead. Uh, well, Hawk maybe wants it to say something. No worries, Brian. You can always cut in front of me if you want. Um, 
All right. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, gave us reason as we were talking with Kaleido to think um, that this might be better as a, as a project rather than lab, at least not to dissuade them from that, is that it's in production use now in a, a, a number of projects. There's traction. There's there's other people beyond their own company who are touching this and uh, uh, want to see it open sourced. Um, we'd like to be able to give it the kind of publicity, frankly, and marketing, so to speak, that uh, um, you get from uh, something that's a project and we tend to, to kind of discourage from things that are purely in labs, although we do break that principle sometimes. Um, uh, and not that things need to be finished uh, or, or in production before they become projects. I mean, Cactus is an example of something that did graduate to a project, but I think labs are for <clears throat> those efforts that are still finding their footing in terms of what they want to be or how they fit into the the, the larger portfolio uh, and projects are for those things where, you know, there's a, some real momentum there. Uh, and um, and there's a commitment to go out and recruit and and uh, uh, companies and developers, contributors, that sort of thing. It's a subjective call, and it's something that we've uh, never been really good at saying. Here's the specific metrics, but I almost think that's the nature of um, nature of community development uh, and what we're doing here. Uh, and this, the, I don't want to introduce the whole question about rebooting the the um, greenhouse and other things. That is a process that's underway to to not make it feel like we're constrained to specifically. 16 projects or only 14 projects or something in uh, in the greenhouse. All right, thank you, Hawk. Yeah, so I'll take a stab at answering Dave's question. Um, the, the TSC has never really been consistent about sort of, uh, well, there, there have been some points that have been consistent, but what the TSC thinks uh, is a project has varied highly over the years. Um, the TSC has even forgotten that some things are projects on occasion. Um, so uh, the, the the consistency is is sort of all over the place, and it obviously you know it's not too surprising given that it changes based on you know who's the TSC, whether some people think we should have like a you know a small number of projects in Hyperledger, some people think we should have a huge number of projects. Um, so it all sort of depends. I would say one thing that has been consistent, and I believe Tracy uh, has been addressing this, um, and obviously Tracy knows this because she's been around Hyperledger since almost the very beginning. Um, we have generally wanted pro uh, projects coming in for incubation to have, I guess, committed resources from people that are not in the same org. So generally at least two different orgs. Um, and I think every project that has been approved has had this. Um, so, so that really has been sort of the, the only hard and fast requirement uh, historically for, for bringing a project into incubation. Um, I'll turn it over, I guess, back to Arno or Gary. Yeah, Gary, go ahead. Yeah, I was, I, I would actually uh, pretty much, I would agree with uh, what, I was going to answer the same question as, as Hart. I, I agree with what you know Hart said in there. I think um, I think the other the other the other thing I think when when we when people look at stuff right is like you know where or I can tell you my considerations for many projects on them or you know but is where do things fit right? Does this make sense as a you know project? Is this the type of stuff that we want to see kind of going forward? Right. I mean, you look at, you know, some of the other, you know, projects that have come in like that are not that are blockchain tech, but not don't necessarily have, you know, aren't aren't or are, are whatever aren't, aren't aren't another version of a ledger. Um, and, you know, I think that's where you kind of, you know, kind of look right. Some of the lab ones, I think, have been more like, well, these might be a good idea. Right. We haven't done a lot on them. Um, it's unclear where they would really fit if there could be kind of, you know, adoption of them or whatever, right? So it is, there are, there are some objective criteria, I guess, right, that you have to kind of pass, you know, per the whatever, but I think in general, you know, as, as Hart said, right, and Arno as well, right, I think it's, and, and Brian too, I guess, it is kind of subjective, but I guess I would have said in general, it's been, does this thing seem like a, <laughs> I don't know. Does your gut tell you this seems like a project is almost kind of the way, <laughs> the way it ends up going. Yes, I agree. That's a definition of subjective. <laughs> Steve. Yeah, just just a, a one point of feedback for for someone who's in the frying pan at the moment. Um, there there are documents out on the TSC wiki about uh, the life cycle and the phases. Um, yeah. 
and you know the there there is a the best definition is for exiting incubation uh, into into active status, and um, there it is laid out for you know to have um, more than one more than a single contributor and um, you know community support um, alignment etc. And so that I, I can't paste the link <laughs> for everyone to look at because chat's disabled. But I wanted to point out um, that. There are some specific uh, pieces of information out there. Uh, as far as incubation, there, there, there is not, for what it's worth in the documentation, anything listed around um, uh, mul mul that, that I've seen around um, you know, some, some of the other topics. So I just wanted to point that out because Tracy started this rabbit hole, I think, asking that question specifically. Yeah, no, but I think that's fair. I mean, you know, every time we go through this, we find, oh, we are lacking documentation, and then we make an effort to, to uh, you know, develop that documentation. And here you catch us, uh, you know, in another case like this, where clearly there is some common knowledge we all share. I mean, all at least the old people like myself who've been around since the beginning of the project. But, uh, you know, yeah. I know it's not ideal. Hopped is back on the queue. Yeah, so I'm going to sympathize with Steve here. As I think uh, we were, you know, I think Cactus was the last project approved. And even if you sort of know all the understood uh, norms and conventions, it, it's still um, quite a bit to, to go through the incubation process. Um, and it would be fantastic if we could streamline it um, so that for, you know, obviously some projects might, some submissions might change the, the direction of Hyperledger enough where they need larger discussion, but I would hope that we could uh, in the future um, have, you know, well-defined enough criteria that, that sort of these uh, project incubation discussions don't get dragged out forever. All right, so we're almost out of time. And uh, it sounds like, you know, people are bouncing around as to whether it should be approved as a project or should we send them to a lab? Or uh, there's another option I'd suggest, which is um, wait, uh, wait on approval for, say, a, a week if, if Kaleido felt, I mean, I know Kaleido has customers using this who've engaged on a technical level with them. Um, you, you know, in our conversations, it, it seemed like there was already uh, some some, mo some movement there. Others who would probably be a part of the project once once launched, they just couldn't speak to specific commitments or anything like that. It, it sounds to me like uh, this is the one issue, this question of, um, you know, outside identified, uh, let's, the word committed is strong, but outside identified uh, additional maintainers on a project like this. Certainly that's required for graduation from incubation, but uh, um, if that's the linchpin, maybe, uh, you know, we could try to work with Kaleido on, on identifying, um, you know, somebody outside of Kaleido who, who would be a, another additional main, uh, another maintainer on the project if accepted. Would that answer this concern? Well, Tracy, I mean, for instance, you raised that question and would that satisfy you or do you feel like, well, yeah, just adding a name there <laughs> makes no difference. Uh, it wouldn't be the first time I think that we added a name, but um, that's a different story. The, uh, I, I think, I think it's a matter of success, right? Um, and, you know, how, how do we, how do we make this a successful uh, project if we bring it in to Hyperledger? Uh, how do we make it a success if we bring it into labs, right? I, I think there's a couple different paths there that we could think through. Um, and, you know, I, I think until people can actually see this as open source, right? I think that's where the challenge is probably for a lot of people. Um, you know, I, I will say that there are things that were 
uh, submit it to labs that, um, you know, have learned a lot from that process, right? Um, learned a lot about how to work in a community, learned a lot about how to market themselves to a greater um, audience. I think there's, you know, I think some of the things that Brian, you mentioned could be obtained from uh, from labs. So I, I don't necessarily know whether or not I would say yay or nay to this at this point. Um, and I don't know what in my mind would would convince me to say yay. <laughs> right? um, I'm a bit on the fence at the moment. Um, and yeah, I don't I don't have an answer, I guess. No, that's fair. So uh, we are quickly running out of time. Steve, do you still have your hand up or is it back on? Yeah, I just wanted to to point out because maybe it's not obvious for for the for who's currently signed the proposal. Um, we do to your to your point a minute ago, Arno. I just wanted to clarify that we we do have you know one one of the largest uh, blockchain consortium in the world, a U.S. based insurance consortium um, called Ristream that has about seventy percent of of the market. Um, that that's the Patrick from from the institutes. Uh, to your point about you know real usage in the world, there are several other uh, or similar uh, groups that are are um, you know running this technology. Uh, to your point, um, we're working our way through the legal process. You know it's going way slower than anyone could ever imagine. Um, we also have blockchain um, uh, vendors. Uh, the, you know, one of them is Atato, who is contributing code into part of, of Firefly today um, to the point about multiple contributors, um, uh, as well as some, some other signatories. So I wanted folks to just familiarize folks with, with that. And, um, you know, I, I guess I'd observe that other projects started with a, a seed contribution from a company, it doesn't seem like an, an unusual uh, path in. We're certainly committed to, um, as, as we started this conversation uh, several meetings ago with the TSC, we're, we are committed to um, doing proper open source, to building a community. I think uh, 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 this, to Gary's point, this is a broad, um, ambitious project. That that is that is solving a, a massive pain point. I think a, a number of, of, of you have told us um, directly that um, this is this is a, a top, probably the top pain point out there that the market is seeing right now. So as far as the potential value of this project, I think it's really significant. Um, and I, I did. You know, so I, I want I definitely want to encourage the TSC to, to do the right thing and, and follow, um, you know, the best practices and the processes. We, we've been, you know, working off the documentation that's there as well as the feedback that we've been yeah, no, getting to, Steve, to go through this process. I'm going to have to cut you off because we're running out of time. So I want to say, I mean, th that's not the issue. We understand you're trying to do your best in presenting this project. And I, I, I do think Tracy raised a, a valid point which is historically, and you know, I've been in the back looking again at the propos various proposals from many of the projects we have, there was at least always two companies committing resources to the project. And so I think, you know, we may not have written this anywhere else and that's a fault, you know, I take that, uh, you know, as a to-do for us to, to address, but, you know, we have been relying on a lot of, uh, com you know, shared knowledge among at least the old timers <laughs> in Hyperledger. And I think, you know, that's the situation. So given that we're out of time, I'm going to close the call on this. What I suggest is you take advantage of the extra week to, to you know, try to see what you can do on that front. I think you have addressed a lot of the questions. So at least there's a better understanding of what this project is about. And I think next week, what I would like is, you know, based on whatever the, the Collido team, you know, manages to do, we'll have a quick uh, uh, update on the situation and then we can make a decision one way or the other, either to send them to a lab or uh, accept as a project. There's no point in dragging this on any further. All right. 
In the meantime, Sophie. sorry, Sophia, we didn't get to you, but we have to close on this. So thank you all for joining. We'll talk again next week. Goodbye.